is taking a while. Oh, okay, great. So uh, uh, the recording has started. Uh, let's resume. Um, so to the question here on uh, chat, uh, where uh, Kennedy asked, how could it be said the author of salvation was made perfect through suffering? So I just posted a response saying Jesus was already perfect in his character and obedience to the Father. Uh, 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 of course, the following verses will show us that uh, the perfection that is being spoken of here is the human experience of pain and sorrow that was made complete in Jesus's life. And um, Christopher has a comment. He says, with being fully God and fully man, Jesus was yet sinless on the earth. So that's a comment, right, Christopher? Or did you want to ask? Actually, I you know just I was just thinking it through. I just felt that uh, you know, being you know in this, uh, you know, this dichotomous uh, sort of uh, um, you know <laughs> kind of uh, you know yeah. sort of situation or you know um, this characteristic of, of Jesus on the earth being fully God and fully man. Uh, it seemed that you know there were there were there were things that that. Um, that he exercised, you know, being fully God. Uh, you know, I mean, if he was fully man, then you know, he could have, he could have, he could have sinned. Uh, you know, and I, every man sins basically. So I mean, I, to that point, uh, uh, I think that you know there were some some parts of being fully God that he he exercised, and there were some uh, some uh, some aspects of him being fully God which he did not exercise. You know, and uh, I think he had all the all the all everything within him being fully God, and um, uh, uh, some 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 parts uh, some some aspects of it he did not he did not actually exercise or he did not you know use when he was on the earth, and being fully man he he actually uh, demonstrated. Uh, aspects of being fully man you know i mean having emotion and having uh, you know feeling hunger and having uh, you know those kind of those kind of things so just it's not a clear question i'm i mean i'm just trying to uh, you know just think through you know how this sort of played out you know uh, being fully god and fully man yeah yeah so yeah uh, christopher we are trying to uh, you know comprehend this whole matter and uh, as we've been saying there were certain attributes or capacities that he left behind and yes there there he was fully god so as you're rightly pointing out he did have uh, the potential to to walk or to demonstrate some of those uh, some of those things but uh, he sort of withheld it but there were times when it came up uh, on the other hand he fully embraced humanity so uh, humanity everything that has to do with humanity the limitations of being a human being the challenges all of that he he walked through so uh, i know our human minds find it very hard to grasp it but we have some clarity um, and uh, let's pray that you know it, it continues to deepen from this point forward um, yes so i i'll just uh, check with shikumar if he wanted to ask a question or share his thoughts. Please go ahead, Shikwa. Uh, OK, uh, Shikwa, I can't hear you. Okay. Ah, now, now we can hear. Please go ahead. No, my question, my, my question, uh, uh, my question is just that, um, in the Romans, uh, sorry, in the um, in the tenth word, where it says that um, um, in the bringing of many sons into the glory. So I just want to know that uh, in the in the Romans chapter eight also, it says that the creation is waiting for the 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 manifestation of the sons of God, and uh, and again the Bible says in Romans chapter eight that those who are led by the spirits of God are the sons of God, spirit of God are sons of God. so. This glory, what what is the 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 author is trying to mention here, is this glory is 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 something which is manifested upon us, or is it going to manifest um, 
in coming days that is my question like no this glory what because in the book of uh, romans it says that the creation is waiting for the glory the manifestation of the sons of god so so my question is are we already in the glory of what that the fullness of that glory which which the jesus wants us to have or the what the bible is saying is it is the future thing thank you pastor that's my question yes uh, thank you, Shikumar. A very uh, pertinent question there. So, what is this glory that we are talking about? All right. Okay. So, uh, I'm not getting the scripture here, but uh, in the book of John where uh, jesus says you have he while talking to the father he says that uh, you know you have given me uh, glory he talks about it so we term it as sonship glory okay sonship glory so jesus walked with a certain glory here on earth which he wanted them to pass on to those who believed in him and so we as his um, disciples now have what is known as sonship glory that's what we are talking about over here shikumar i i couldn't find that exact verse when i find it i'll uh, post it for you later john but sonship sorry john 1722 okay let's look at it yeah Thank you, Zidane. So uh, this is John chapter 17, verse 22. I, I've given them the glory you gave me. So they may be one as we are one. I'm reading the NLT translation here. So John 17 and verse 12, uh, this is referring to sonship glory. Yeah, I, I hope that uh, answers your question there. Uh, yes, Pastor. Now my question is then, um... What about in the Corinthians is say that uh, we will move from glory to glory. This is the same sonship glory we will move from glory to glory, or the sonship glory is to operate on this earth, is it? Uh -huh. So that's what sonship glory is to operate on the earth, uh, and there is a different glory when we, uh, you know, move on from from this world into uh, the the age to come, and uh, you know, eternal life and after death and all that so that's how we will perceive it Shikumar. so there's certain glory we require to live that victorious life here on earth and jesus gives that to us and we are calling that glory here on earth sonship glory there'll be a different glory when okay. we are thank you pastor thank you awesome. Thanks a lot. yeah thank you okay uh, so really nice so interesting uh, to meditate on all these uh, scriptures um, yeah, so we've done till verse uh, 10. Let's move on to verse 11. So uh, we can read verses 11 through 13, and uh, anyone can volunteer. Hebrews chapter 2, verse uh, 11. Yeah, even 14, I guess you can read. 11 to 14. 11 to 14. Okay, either of you were lost. Asa, go ahead. Okay, yes, Kishan. Is that okay? Say, Asha. Asha, yes, you can yes. Asha, go ahead, please. Thank you. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing and praise, and I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that true death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil.
Yes. So uh, we saw in the, the, the verses from 11 to 13 more about the humanity of Jesus. So uh, Jesus, you know, we talked about all his titles, the begotten uh, and uh, the express image of God, exalted. So many things we saw about Jesus. But see here, uh, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, that's referring to the believers. Those who are being sanctified are who? They are the believers. Are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So, see, Jesus, it's again, everything is, is just so amazing in revealing the kind of relationship that God wants with us. Uh, here, he's called our brother, Jesus, my brother. Okay, Jesus, my savior, Jesus, my Lord, Jesus, uh, you know, so many other titles we give him, but he doesn't mind being called our brother. And in that whole Jewish context, you know, being a brother, being a kinsman, being related to someone came with its responsibilities, very strong responsibilities. So uh, there's also uh, an indication towards that where uh, there is that bond of love, but God is also like, hey, whatever needs to be done, I'm there for you. You know, I'm there to care for you. I'm, I'm there, you know, walking with you. That kind of a that kind of a, a sense of care and care is what comes through here. And it says he's not ashamed to call them brethren. So imagine how strengthening this word must have been to the uh, believers of the first century in their pain. The writer is saying, you have a brother, you know, and uh, this brother, he, for them, brother, oh, brother, okay, my a family member who will take some responsibility regarding us. So he's trying to tell them, you're not alone. You have this great God who's not ashamed to call you brethren, or in other words, he's your brother. He's even coming to that extent. And uh, verse 12 saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. See, it, it's like embracing the people, embracing the believers and saying, you're part of my family. You know, we, we uh, have a deeper bond. So uh, I, I will declare your name to my brethren. So the believers are brethren. It shows so many things. Uh, as a human being, yes, he is saying, you know, I am sharing in your humanity. Um, but it's also showing how he's not, you know, he's not, um, uh, or he, his humility, humility. In other words, we can see that. Why would he want to call himself a brother? You know, again, he could have chosen some other title, but the Bible is showing us that he doesn't mind being humble. It doesn't take away anything from him. You know, trying to establish that kind of a uh, human relationship with us. Okay. And uh, there is the beauty of God right there. It says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing you, sing praise to you. So, again, that conversation within the, the Trinity where Jesus, you know, he is praising the Father. So there is so much honor within the Trinity. The Father is honoring the Son. The Son is honoring the, the Father. So they are working. They're not fighting against each other, but they're all working together. And uh, verse 13, and again, uh, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. So see, basically, it's just humanity, the children whom God has given me. And uh, we'll go on to verse 14 from here but before that uh, i think there's a question yes uh, say please go ahead thank you pastor so i was just going to ask that would, would it be okay to say that um jesus is my big brother or my elder brother in the understanding we have from the scripture yes so we can we can say that um see all of these things that we are learning you know even this concept of jesus is my brother it's great 
but i would also add that we shouldn't we shouldn't um, you know extrapolate and uh, bring many other things uh, out of it for example you know we'll look at the old testament it says god says i'm your husband he says to to uh, israel that's great god's people so what what is the essence of what he say he say commitment you know responsibility protection all that i i take care of you like that uh, but then you know if if it goes to the point of where uh, people claim that hey you no know, god is my husband it becomes a little peculiar okay so uh, that's my point so we say jesus is my brother uh, because we understand the essence of what he's trying to say uh, but then to constantly uh, you know keep saying that hey jesus is my lover this is my it shouldn't become a peculiar thing or a weird weird uh, sort of a concept or doctrine does it make sense it makes it makes sense basically you're saying we shouldn't kind of um, believe to jesus christ in such a way that we only just term him as elder brother and we forget that this is our lord and savior this is our i i, I think i i basically think what you're saying just concentrate more on the essence the uh-huh. relationship exactly. he wants to That's have with point. god yeah okay awesome thank you pastor yeah. thank you. Sure. yes thank you thank you so much okay all right so moving on now to verse uh, 14 so in some um, bibles when you see they'll they'll separate the sections no so then they they have this title jesus the elder brother for this portion uh, and we understand when when he says elder brother he is just saying hey i'm taking responsibility and that was what was understood in the culture uh, back then so verse 14 in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood which is talking about us that we are human he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death so remember we saw earlier he tasted death on for everyone and why taste death through death he might destroy him who had the power of death so we know that it was actually the triumph uh, uh, or, you know of the cross when jesus died uh, and so destroy him who had power of death is satan that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage so uh, it simply talks about our redemption it talks about the hope of resurrection okay? uh, obviously humanity saw death as the end uh, but we know from uh, scripture that death is not the end uh, there are you know two destinies after that and when we are born again we believe in the lord jesus we accept what jesus christ has done through his sacrifice we now uh, uh, have salvation which you know as our uh, in turn we, we have heaven as our final destination uh, and you know it also talks about the hope that came about after what jesus did so before that humanity would have thought oh death is the end death is the end but for us believers now you know, even if a loved one who believes passes away or we taste death we know that there is the hope of the resurrection satan has been defeated and we also have this wonderful hope of resurrection we read about that in uh, passages in first thessalonians first thessalonians 4 13 to 18 where paul encourages them that hey come on uh, there is going to be the the second coming and all the saints will rise up and they will come with jesus so don't be discouraged so the very fear of death that humanity grapples with uh, praise god that the lord jesus has overcome that was uh, um 16 where it was 16 now for indeed he does not give aid to angel but he does give aid to the seed of abraham so again going on speaking about this privilege to mankind you know how beautiful it said a man already has dominion 
and then Jesus has come, he calls him, he has shared in our humanity, he is not ashamed to call us his brother. Okay, and it's also stating this passage is also stating that human beings and believers, we now have this opportunity to receive the help of angels, the aid. You know, not give aid to angels, simply say God gives us that help that we need. And also there is another um, uh, way of describing the believers where he says the seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. Now, technically, the seed of Abraham are the Jewish people. Naturally, they are the, they are the descendants. But if we look at you know, passages such as Galatians 3, 7, we read that by faith, everyone who believes, we who believe are now who? We are the seed of Abraham. Again, he's telling the believers, come on, you are, to the Jewish believers particularly, you're more than just seed as descendants, but now by faith also, you are the seed of Abraham. And uh, this is helpful for us because we may not be from that same race, but just because we are believers by faith, we are the seed of Abraham. And saying seed of Abraham has its own implications because then we can talk about the blessings that God promised Abraham. So if God promised Abraham and his descendants by faith, we are the descendants of Abraham. So we too have a part in the blessings that God promised Abraham. So it's just sort of re-emphasizing humanity and how Jesus shared in that humanity and uh, how he is establishing that relationship with us, uh, uh, particularly the believers. Now moving on to verse 17, it says, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. So you see, he shared in our humanity that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So there's another uh, um, concept that people usually talk about, uh, and that is identification. So we said substitution that we understood. Jesus became our substitute. Identification. What is identification? Identification is he became like us. He tasted humanity like us. So when we say tasted humanity like us, we've already mentioned, um, you know, the limitations of, of being a human, uh, the pain, the suffering, the good parts as well, the joys uh, that we experience as a human being. But in entirety, uh, he tasted what humanness felt like. And that was important. That was important for uh, Jesus because he then is the best representative that we have. Okay, So he identified with us. That's what this passage is, the scripture is saying. Uh, he was made like the brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So he, he became the best high priest that we could ever have. Now, if we even study about high priests, we know that a human being, a representative of the children of Israel would be made the high priest because he could understand his people, okay? And that would lead him to represent the people well. In the same way, Jesus tasted humanity and it's not like he cannot relate with us, right? So when we, when we um, say, oh God, you know, I'm struggling with sin, I'm struggling with uh, addictions, I'm struggling with, with uh, something else, I'm suffering, I'm going through all this in my life. The beauty is not only can he represent us now, but it adds more attributes to, uh, or, or rather talks about, uh, brings out, certain attributes that God has. He says, merciful, faithful high priest. Isn't that a privilege? 
No, we can have any high priest representing us, but because he's gone through humanness, he understands. So sharing in humanity, uh, that's what we're talking about today. Jesus shared in our humanity. How did he share? No, he shared it in such a way that he's become our merciful and faithful high priest that we could even you know go to him and that he would understand us uh, and you know that is the reason we, we read that he sends us aid he gives us help because he knows that we need the uh, uh, aid or support that is required so that's a, a little bit from uh, hebrews chapter 2 We'll just pause for a bit in case there are things that we want to discuss, and then we'll uh, jump right into Hebrews chapter 3. Yes, yes, say. Yes, Pastor. I, I just wanted to make a suggestion based on the explanation of the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, for anyone, um, I think we talked about it that if you really want to just have a glimpse of Jesus in his humanity. Maybe you could go through the series chosen. It kind of gives a, a bit of perspective of Christ in his humanity. So it would kind of throw more light on what Pastor has talked about here, about him being sharing in our humanity. I think the chosen series does a good job in kind of exemplifying Christ in that light to us, how he came in human form and how he lived among men. I just wanted to make that suggestion. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Abe, for that. Uh, I've heard uh, about the Joseph C series. I haven't seen it. Um, I think, yeah, I and mean, if those who are interested, you could look that up. Uh, I can only <laughs> refer to the Gospels. Um, so even reading the Gospels over and over again uh, is very helpful for us to continually understand how did he live how did he walk what did he do uh, and you know how exactly he shared in our humanity so thank you thank you for adding that uh is there anything else that anyone wanted to talk about Um, let's move forward then. We will uh, look at uh, chapter 3 of Hebrews. And here, oh, okay. Oh, yes, Christopher, please go ahead. Now, I just wanted to also uh, refer to this, um, this gospel verse, um, which is. Um, you know, John uh, 14, 12. And uh, it, uh, well, uh, it's mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, very, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So, um, I mean, in this in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, this, um, this the nature of, 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 of Jesus on the earth, uh, there's also a mention of, of uh, you know, um, you know, human being being able to do even greater things than uh, what uh, what Jesus did. Uh, so I don't know, you know, in uh, in, in, in in you know in the context in the context of that, you know, the, the potential that that is available uh, when we have uh, you know when we have the Holy Spirit uh, with us. To do even greater things, so yeah, just thought I'll just mention that, and uh, maybe Pastor, if you can just explain that that point um, there, uh, you know, because um, sometimes that <laughs> that can be quite uh, uh, confusing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Christopher. Uh, Jesus did say that that we shall do. Uh, we who believe, we will do greater things than these. So what he was really this is how we understand it. Uh, Jesus did so many miracles, and uh, in fact, there are places where it says that if we record all the, uh, you know, miracles that Jesus did, there there, there wouldn't be place to record it. Something like that. So that 
there were many things that Jesus did. And uh, in John 14, 12, amazingly, he said, you shall do greater things than these. So what was he talking about? And we don't even know uh, what, what kind of miracles he did and how great they were. Some are mentioned, some are captured for us in the Gospels. So how do we understand this? Greater works. See, now we have the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And that is why uh, Jesus told all his disciples, even after they were born again, John 20, uh, he breathed on them and the Holy Spirit came to indwell them. So they became born again, technically. So they had the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But still, he told them, tarry, okay? wait uh, for the uh, Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you know, to empower the believer with the supernatural works of God. So that's how we are able to do the, the greater works. What are these greater works? See, we can look at it like Christopher, uh, not better works than Jesus. It's not like that. The way we understand greater works is greater in number. See, he had three years of ministry here on earth. Uh, now, some of us may have many more years than that to do our ministry. Uh, and even, you know, if you look at population wise, you could say, hey, we have more opportunities. So in number, more works, supernatural works of God can take place. So in that sense, yes, greater, we can say that. Now, how else can this greater be interpreted? See, in the times of Jesus, maybe certain miracles will not be uh, applicable. For example, today. Uh, there are people who testify that they had uh, some sort of uh, a metal implant in their body, but after prayer, it changed into bone. Okay, so in Jesus' times, things like this could not have happened because nobody was doing metal implants. At least nothing that I know of. So today, it's possible. It's so unusual to say that... Uh, something like this has taken place. So in that sense also, uh, we use this term greater, okay? But one thing we are clear of, we are not claiming um, greater ability than Jesus or, you know, uh, like more credit than Jesus. That's not the point. It simply means more in number and unusual as compared to Jesus' times. So I hope that uh, gives you some perspective. Does it help, Christopher? Oh, yeah. OK, he says thanks. So thank you, Christopher. Uh, yes, Divya, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I just had uh, wanted to add on to what uh, uh, Christopher was, uh, was asking, as well as I had a comment. Uh, just. Uh, as I was reading this John 14, 12, it's the latter part of the verse that really caught my attention because he says, um, greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Uh, uh, so either it can be as uh, like Pastor Nancy, you said, uh, like the Holy Spirit will be sent, right? Once uh, Jesus Christ goes to the father. And also, I, I think, as he goes to the father there is um, that intercession that takes place or uh, you know uh, it's uh, i don't know what in uh, like technically what is happening but there's something uh, which i'm not aware of but he says when he says because i go to the father you will do greater works i like to read it in that way uh, so it makes sense to me and also, I was uh, uh, looking at the uh, verse, uh, chapter two, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, where it talks about the high priest. Uh, like the, uh, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Uh, yeah, so 
in that uh, case also uh, in order for him to be the high priest uh, like he acts as a mediator right like he is representing the people as well as he's a representative of god as well <laughs> like it's a uh, it's a beautiful picture uh, of the when we say he is the high priest uh, so yeah grateful for that uh, you know um, especially when it says he's a merciful high priest why because he is he knows right he knows all our uh, temptations, all the weaknesses, uh, still he shows mercy towards us. Um, and also it says a faithful high priest. I was just thinking about uh, the Jews in, in those times. Uh, Divya, we, we lost your audio there. Okay, and that too through the high priest. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm just grateful for uh, yeah that aspect of Jesus Christ that's mentioned over here, there as the high priest. Sure. It's just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, Divya, uh, thank you for sharing. But the last bit that you said uh, when I think of the Jews during those times, we lost your voice there. If you could briefly share oh, that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I was just telling, uh, like the Jews of those days, they could approach God um, uh, for the propitiation of sins only once in a, like a day of atonement, right? Just once in a year. And when we think about that, like we are so privileged, like we can go to God, uh, like for the forgiveness or confessing our sins, like any time, like it has made, it has been made possible only because of Jesus Christ. Otherwise it's like, oh, I can't imagine uh, what would have been our state. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your views. Um, so just one point that uh, I, I want to uh, make, or even mention the latter part of the verse where he says, when I go to the Father. So uh, yes, the main thing that changed was that the Holy Spirit was then sent, uh, which he talked about you know, in uh, uh, the book of John. And uh, we, were, we received the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And as far as intercession is concerned, uh, that's that's the point I want to make. So the intercession of Jesus, yes, he's interceding in heaven. But one one aspect about intercession is we've, we've seen that in prayer and intercession goes where the act of Jesus of dying on the cross in itself is an intercession. So uh, that that is something I wanted to say. He's praying right now, but he's also done his intercession through the sacrifice on the cross. So yeah, praise God for all that we are learning about uh, the Lord Jesus and who he is uh, and how that applies to our lives. So uh, just think with me about the author and his intention. So he's trying to help the believers, the first century believers, the Jewish believers, uh, and he's telling them, you have a one, you have a great salvation. Uh, you have Jesus who is deity. He made that point, and he demolished their view of worshiping angels and told them, no, no, Jesus is exalted. They worship Jesus, so we are supposed to worship Jesus. So he made that point. Maybe there was that philosophy of Jesus was not fully human. So then he talked about it, and he said, no, Jesus was fully human. He went through the pain, and you know, he went through the sufferings and all, and he was perfected right through the sufferings and now he is a merciful and faithful high priest so he established that view now he's coming to another a crucial crucial uh, point that he makes wants to make for the believers and that is he wants to establish the greatness of jesus over moses uh, now why does he want to do this in, in chapter 3 that's what we will see he wants to do this because in their view they honored many of these, uh, you know, 
leaders and fathers as they as they took abraham and jacob and moses and moses had a very uh, great standing in their eyes and somewhere their honor uh, for for moses would have been greater because they learned that they really soaked in these things and now uh, even though they know about the Lord Jesus, as they're going through their uh, challenges, they are probably not understanding, you know, uh, who is greater. And so he wants to make it very, very clear to the believers that Jesus is greater than Moses, that Jesus is the faithful son over the house of God, deserving a greater glory than the kind of glory that Moses he, he will establish, he will say, Moses, who is Moses? He was a minister of God. He was one who was serving God. And that's that's what he will uh, do now. And he will continue to ex uh, exhort the believers to, to keep on um, growing in the faith and not sidetrack. And he will also state that rebellion and unbelief will keep us out of the promises of God. So that's what we have in chapter 3. So let's begin uh, at verse 1. Uh, could somebody please read till verses 1 through 5 or even 6, 1 through 6. Verse 1 to 6. Hmm. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself for every house is built by someone but god is the builder of everything moses was faithful was 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 faithful as a servant in all god's house bearing witness to what would be spoken by god in the future but christ is faithful as the son over god's house and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and hope in which we glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you for reading that saying. So as we can see here, a couple of things he addresses the believers. Uh, see, this is exhortation. So it's like it's going to be a mix of uh, encouragement, warning, encouragement, warning. So now encouragement. He's saying, uh, holy brethren, now that we've understood the work of Jesus, who are we? We are in Christ. We, uh, we are being sanctified, but we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Holy brethren. Okay, That's one way in which he addresses. Then he again encourages them. He says, partakers of the heavenly calling. So he wants them to have that uh, spiritual mindset, not just earthly mindset. Know who you are in Christ. And that's why he's calling them with all these words. And moving on, he says, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So again, he's trying to reveal who Christ is to us. He says he's the apostle. Who is an apostle? We know we've talked about it. He said somebody who is sent forth. He's delegated. In a sense, so they are sent forth with orders. Uh, somebody like uh, a messenger, or a better word would be an ambassador. So the Father sent the Son, the Lord Jesus. So that's how we see Jesus, the Apostle. He's the Apostle. He says, Give attention or consider uh, to consider Jesus. He also says, He's the high priest of our confession. What does it mean? See, high priest of our confession simply means that the Father, uh, Jesus is in the presence of the Father. He's the apostle and high priest. So when we confess what is aligned to the 
word of god uh, it's something like he uh, he represents our confession up in heaven or he kind of backs up our confession in heaven so we must make confessions which are aligned to the word of god because who is jesus he has become the high priest of our confession who backs up those godly confessions so uh, there is value in the words we speak you know every sunday at church we exhort the people about what we believe what we speak the power of the words now when we speak aligned to the word of god we have a high priest who is backing up those same words of faith those words of truth in the present he is also jesus is the apostle he is the high priest of my confession so i need to make the right uh, confession that's another encouragement uh, he wants to give the people that confess confess faith uh, because jesus is the high priest of your confession and then now he comes to this whole thing about moses and jesus so that he can establish that jesus is greater so it's quite clear in what he has written there uh, he says uh, christ jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him so jesus was faithful as moses was also faithful in the work that god gave moses but what is the difference the difference is he says you know when there is a house uh, there is somebody who has built the house you know somebody who owns the house and there are, there could be those who serve in the house so that is the distinction between jesus and moses jesus is the son of the house the house belongs to him or who is this house what is this house we know when paul wrote to timothy he said house of god the family of god those of us who believe uh, and of course part of that family is also those who have gone on uh, into eternity <coughs> we who are alive believing those who have gone uh, into eternity believing and also uh, part of the house of god are the heavenly beings so what we'll do is we will uh, hold on uh, up until here we will pause we will uh, come back you know next uh, class and continue from here could somebody please lead in a word of prayer as we close Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful unto you for how far you have brought us. We pray the Lord, you continue to cause your word to manifest in our lives and cause us to work in your glory as Jesus walked in your glory on earth. Father, we pray that we commit the rest of our activities in the day to your glorious hands. Continue to keep us, O God, and cause us to be fruitful. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Elisha. Thank you, everyone, for connecting to this class. Um, let's continue to pray that you know we can gain the most out of the book of Hebrews and the other books to come. So have a blessed weekend, and uh, let's meet uh, next Friday. God bless. Bye until then. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you.